a good afternoon today? I hope so. Hope you got rested up a little bit. And uh, thankful you're here with us tonight. Looking forward to a good service. And uh, Chris Campbell, would you mind opening us in a word of prayer tonight? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness.
Father, we thank you again today for the way you bless our lives. We thank you for allowing us to be here. Father, we thank you for the request. Lord, I think of Jim Rector's brother-in-law, and I think of Tom's son. Father, we just give these to you. You are the almighty physician, God. We love you and thank you. We pray that you bless them, that you continue to watch over their families. Now, as we take the offering, we pray that it be for the further your word. Father, and those that are not here, we just pray for them, whether they're traveling, ill. Father, you know the circumstance. Just continue to watch over Lead, guide, and direct. Lord, we love you and thank you. In your precious name I pray. Making more money. Is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> that 
they really have worked hard on that, and I uh, appreciate it. So it'll be a good time, and yeah, excited for it. Well, I think that's all the announcements I have, so if you want to come, I need one more song. Can Rain Seed, we'll sing page 251, The Lily of the Valley, looking at our love for Christ this evening. The Lily of the Valley, the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Is he that to you? Is he fair to you? You love him that much. Let's sing together, page 251. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow is my comfort, in trouble is my strength. He tells me every care of it to go.
because each and every member of that church was a witness. They did it multiply, or they didn't add to themselves, they multiplied to themselves because it wasn't just the pastor who was sharing the gospel. It wasn't just the deacons that were sharing the gospel, it was the church body. And we see that duplication take place, and by the time we get to Acts chapter 6, most commentaries believe they were between 20 and 40,000 members in that church. Now that's a mega church, isn't it? And we look at verse 1, and look what it has to say is going on in the church. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among ye seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who be who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and then there are six other men, and we will skip down to verse number six. <laughs> Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Look at verse seven. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I'd like to give a few thoughts this morning or this evening. Uh, from Acts chapter 6. Lord, I thank you for our church. And Lord, I thank you for the, uh, the heartbeat behind this church. And, and as we even come into this week with Vacation Bible School, that we don't want to be a, a church that's just inward focused. We want to be a church that takes your gospel to the world like you call us to. And Lord, I pray you'd be with Robert this week and give him wisdom, give him strength, and, and uh, that you would just give him power as we uh, head into this Vacation Bible School week. I pray that you do the same with our workers. Lord, I pray that you bring in people that have hearts that are willing and receptive to your word. And, uh, we thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. As I mentioned before, the church in Jerusalem was growing. It was up to the tens of thousands at this point. But the church at this point, even though it's growing, it has a problem. And uh, you know, the truth is, even healthy churches have problems. Did you know that? Even healthy churches are going to have decisions to make where there's going to be differing opinions. And even a growing church is going to have growing pains where everything's not quite right and, and there's going to be struggles. But the difference between a healthy church and an unhealthy church isn't whether there are problems or not. The difference between a healthy church and an unhealthy church is how do they handle those problems when they arise. And the apostles, they, they had a lot of wisdom when it came to how they were going to handle the problems that had, had cropped up in their church. There were two groups of people in the church. There were the Hebrews and there were the Grecians. And the, the great thing about the gospel is, is the gospel is no respecter of men. All, all, all ground is level at the foot of the cross. And uh, that's the same for us today. Whether you're, the, whether you're the boss at where you are and you own the company or whether you sweep the floors, when we come in here, we are all one in Christ. And, and, and there's no respecter of persons with God. And they, they said, well, here's our problem. The Grecians were upset with how their widows were being treated compared to the Hebrew widows. And they went to the apostles and they said, hey, we, we've got a problem. They said, we, we were looking at the uh, benevolence line the other day and, and that Hebrew widow that you know, you gave her $50. And the Grecian lady that you don't know, you only gave her $25 and we have a problem. He said, we, we were watching the food line, and the, 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 the Hebrew lady that came through, you, you gave her Jack's donuts. <laughs> and uh, the Grecian lady, she just got donuts. <laughs> and, and we got a problem with that. And there's this, there's this conflict that's going on between the Hebrews and the Grecians. And, and uh, the, this, the apostles, they said, well, here's what we're going to do. You pick out seven men of good report, a good testimony, full of the Holy Ghost, well-respected, godly men, and, and you put them in charge of that ministry, and here's what they said, because it is not meet for us to stop doing the ministry of prayer and preaching the Word of God. Now, what are they saying? Are they 
saying they're too good for that ministry? No, that's not what they're saying. All they're saying is this. God has called us to this specific ministry, and there are not enough hours in the day to do what God has called us to and to also do what this need needs met with. And, and, and so we're going to delegate, and we're going to meet this need by the church body taking care of the church body. And these seven men, they, they met this need, and, and uh, they started to take care of these women, and they met the need of the church. And look what happens in verse 7, when each part of the body of Christ does what it's supposed to be doing. It says, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Isn't that interesting? That, that when you have a pastor who is doing what God has called him to do, which uh, a simple outline that always stuck with me is a, a pastor is called to lead, to feed, and to intercede. That makes it simple, and I like that. When the pastor is doing what he's called to do, and the, the deacons are doing what they're called to do, and serving the body and meeting needs, and, and the church body, it's doing what it's called to do by utilizing their individual spiritual gifts to meet the needs of the church and to, to serve the Lord. When the church does church, God's way, things work pretty well, don't they? It says, when each member of the body did their God-given roles, the word of God increased. And the number of disciples was multiplied. And they made an impact in that city because each of them was faithful to do what God had called them to do. And that's not really where we're going to land tonight, but I, I thought that was too good a section to pass up. The guy we're introduced to here, the one we're going to spend our time on tonight, is a guy named Stephen. He's one of these seven men that was picked to oversee this widow's ministry. And Stephen, he is, I think maybe, he'd be up there, one of the greatest examples of what it looks like to be a witness for Christ. Stephen, you look at his life, and from chapter 6 through chapter, uh, end of chapter 7, we can see some characteristics of Stephen. He was a witness for the Lord. He, he took his faith and he, he spread it to others that needed it. And that's, that's what we're trying to do this week, isn't it? We're, we're not just trying to have a fun time. We want to have a fun time. But, but what's our goal? We want to see the gospel shared with those young people that haven't heard it before. We want to take the love of Christ and we want to, to display it to them in the way that we love them and the things that we teach them. And, and we want to take the Great Commission. And that's what we want to implement this week. That's what we've been called to. And so quickly tonight, I'll be quick. I know we've got a lot to set up afterwards for Vacation Bible School, but I, I want to give you ten marks of a powerful witness. Stephen was a powerful witness. And if you look at his life, and you can see some great characteristics and some takeaways of what it looks like to be a witness for Christ. First of all, number one, he was marked by godliness. In verse 3 of chapter 6, it says that he was a man... That was of honest report. He had a good, godly testimony. A little further into the story, we'll find out that there were some religious leaders that were trying to look for and trying to find anything they could on Stephen to get dirt on him, to, to discredit his ministry. And there was nothing that they could grab hold of because he had a godly testimony. What he preached was backed up with the way he lived his life. His life agreed with his message. And you know, I, I think many times we have to do more than just live a godly life to share the gospel, but, but I don't think we can do much until we live a godly life when it comes to sharing the gospel. Nobody wants to, to hear the gospel from someone who's living like the world, do they? Uh, think about it this way. If you're looking for a personal trainer, do you want to hire a guy that's about 500 pounds? I don't think you do. If you're looking for an accountant, do you want to hire one that has gone bankrupt three times? I don't think that's what you want. And if you're going to listen to someone about who God is, do you want to listen to someone who's an ungodly person? That's not what you want. And the first thing we see about Stephen, his first characteristic, is that he was marked by godliness. The way he lived his life backed up the message that he proclaimed. He was marked by godliness. Not only that, but he was also marked by wisdom. It says in verse 3, he says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom. In a little bit, Stephen is going to find himself in a debate with several religious leaders. And, and these are 
very well educated, very intelligent men, and, and they are trying to poke holes in Stephen's faith. They're, they're trying to poke holes in the fact of whether or not Jesus Christ really was the Messiah. And Stephen had such a handle on Scripture that he was able to take their attacks and he was able to refute every one of them. He had incredible wisdom. You know, I think it's interesting that in our culture today, Christians take a lot of flack for having faith in the Bible. It, it's almost as if the world looks at us and says, if you have faith in the Bible, then you must be someone that totally ignores logic and totally ignores science and totally ignores reason. And they say to have faith in the Bible is a blind faith. I tell you what, that's not the faith of the Bible. The faith of the Bible is not a blind faith, it's a reasonable faith. The, 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 the truth of the Word of God, it can stand up to scrutiny. It can handle the weight of questioning because the, the Word of God is truth. And uh, you look at the Word of God and, and yes, we have faith, but it is not blind faith, it is a reasonable faith. How many of you have been over to Cincinnati and uh, that area there? and either been to the Creation Museum or to the Ark over there. Are, aren't you thankful for some of the high IQ, well-educated Christians that show that Christianity isn't just some back-of-the-woods redneck religion? Would, would you agree with that? They, they, they put in the research, they put in the thought, and, and I tell you, you study it out, you come to the conclusion that the Word of God is the truth. And uh, I, I think it's funny. A lot of people, atheists, will say, well, well, to believe in Christianity, that's just blind faith. I think it's reasonable faith, and I'll go to, as far as to say to believe in atheism would be blind faith. You, you look at the evidence of uh, creation around us, and you come to the conclusion that someone did not create it. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's ignoring a lot of logic and science and reasoning that you claim to stand on. Uh, you, you look around the world, and you look at the the, the Bible and the prophecies that are fulfilled in it, the evidences that are inside of it, and, and to come to the conclusion that this world just came from nothing, boy, that, there's not a lot of logic in that. To, me. to, to look at the, the universe, it's made up of time and energy and, and, and all this other stuff, and to say that it just came out of nowhere, well, that goes against every scientific thinking process there is, and yet they say that's science, and I say that's blind science. But the word of God, it is reasonable faith. Stephen, he welcomed the questions from these religious leaders because he knew Christianity had good answers. And uh, sometimes we will, in our witnessing, we will shy away from witnessing because we think, well, what if they ask a question that I don't know the answer to? Have you ever thought that before? Well, I'll tell you this. If the word of God is true, then that means there probably is a good, reasonable answer to their question. And so if you don't know it, you say, Hey, that's a great question. Let me study that and get back to you. And I, I bet you the Word of God has a good answer to their question. Because the truth can stand up to the weight of questioning. And Stephen, he was a man marked by wisdom. And they couldn't poke holes in his faith because of the wisdom and the truth of the Word of God. He was marked by wisdom. He was marked by faith. Look at verse 5. It says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Stephen was a man of faith. He trusted the Lord. He, he believed God's promises and he acted on them. That's what faith is. Faith is, is, is such a belief, such a trust, that it affects the way that you live. And Stephen, he believed the word of God. He believed that he had been called to share the word of God to the extent that that he acted on it, and it ended up costing him his life. He was a man of faith. Not only was he a man of faith, but he was also a man of power. In verse 8, it says this, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Two times before it says Peter was powerful, it tells us where his power came from. And it was through the fact that he was full of the Holy Spirit. We talked about this before. The power of the Christian life is, is not found in and of ourselves, but it is found through God. And Stephen, he, he had the power of God in his life. He was able to perform miracles and to perform 
of signs, and God was allowing him to give credibility to his own message, and, and uh, all of that was the power of John. He was marked by power. But then fifth of all, I want you to see this, and we'll, we'll park here for a few minutes. He was marked by love. He was marked by love. Look at verse 10. It says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. The, the word irresistible spirit literally means his attitude or his disposition. You know, people, as we witness to them, as we share the gospel, there will be times where they may be offended by our message. They may be offended by our position. But there should never be a time where they are offended by our disposition. Amen? When we speak the truth, it's to be spoken in love. Here, Stephen, he had, he had a loving spirit, an irresistible spirit. You know, God has not called us to win debates. He's called us to win souls, hasn't he? And uh, he has not called us to, to go on Facebook or to uh, attack people in person and, and, and win an argument with the result of losing the person. He's called us to go after people and to love people. I was, um, how many of you have met Patty Harding yet? Patty, she's become, she's become one of my friends, and she is a very interesting lady. She has a lot of fantastic stories. She was in the hospital a couple weeks ago, and I went over to visit her, and, and she just started telling me uh, stories from her past. And uh, she said that for, I forget how many years, she has been a parole officer uh, and worked with youth that have, been, have gotten in some uh, trouble and that sort of thing. And she started telling me this one story. She said there was a 16-year-old a girl that had been caught with some buddies drinking underneath the bridge in Nicetown. And because of that, she had to meet with Patty once a week for six months. She said the first week that girl walked into her office and sat down in the chair across from Patty, and before Patty could even say a word, the young lady on the other side of the desk looked at her and said, she said, I just want you to know, I don't like you, and I'm not going to say a word the whole time we're here. And Patty said, she looked back at this girl, and she said, okay. And the girl went on about how much she hates her, and can't believe I have to be here, and all that and went on for another two or three minutes. Patty said she looked at that girl and said, is that all you got? <laughs> she said, have you got anything else to say? Now's the time. And she said that girl went on for another three or four minutes. By this point, they're close to halfway through their meeting. And uh, she just let this girl talk and vent for 10, 15 minutes. And, and, and finally, Patty looked at this young girl and said, she said, are you done now? And the girl said, yeah, I'm done. She said, uh, she said, she said, well, I want you to know, my goal is not to be your friend. She said, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to be a help to you. And she explained what she was trying to accomplish and all this sort of thing. And, and uh, she said, we got to meet for the next six months. I, I think it would be beneficial for both of us if we could just learn to get along. And she said, by the end of that meeting, that girl that walked in <coughs> and said, I'm not going to say a word to you, was spilling her guts to Patty. She said, at the end of the meeting, they both stood up. They were walking towards the door, and the girl stopped and turned around. She said, she said, would you mind if I gave you a hug? And Patty said, sure. The girl gave her a hug, and, and uh, the 16-year-old the girl said this, and that's why I shared. She said, you are the only authority that has ever taken the time to listen to me. And I tell you what, just a little bit of love made all the difference in her ability to influence that life, didn't she? And uh, that's what we're called to. We're called to influence the world with the gospel, but you're not going to do that with a, 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 a grouchy look on your face and a harsh word in your voice. Pe people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And we come to this week, and, and uh, I, I just can't help thinking about Vacation Bible School. I'm excited for Vacation Bible School. And... What are we going to try to do this week? We're going to try to bring these kids in. Some of them don't know what it's like to be loved at home. And we as a church, one of the things we're going to try to do is to make sure that they know they are loved this week. Amen? One of the, one of the best positions in Vacation Bible School, I, they're all great, but uh, what I always thought would be one of the best positions was the group leader. <coughs> You're in charge of 
of sixth grade or you're in charge of fourth grade and, and you are with that little group of kids the whole week. You go to game time together, you go to cooking time together, you sit through the lesson time together and, and, and you get to be a personal ambassador to that little group of kids that entire week. Man, don't waste that. Make sure you take advantage of that. Get, get those kids uh, some candy bars. Get to know their names. Make, make sure that they know that they are loved when they come here. Amen? Amen. If you're working with the, the cookies and giving out cookies, man, we've got tons of cookies, don't we? And uh, most of them tasted pretty good. From what I can tell. <laughs> man, give them an extra cookie. Uh, get to know that kid when he walks through the line. Ask him a question. Don't just throw a cookie down to him. Get to know who he is. Let him know that they're loved. Right, Ron? We, we're not just trying to run a program. We're, we're, we're trying to reach people. And Stephen, he had an irresistible spirit. He loved people. He, he was more interested in winning the person than he was winning a debate. And he was marked by love. Sixth of all. Number six, he was marked by faithfulness. The church at this point was growing. There were lots of people that were getting saved. Many people were receiving the gospel, but there were some who didn't. And I tell you, that's always going to be the case. There's always going to be some people that no matter how lovingly, no matter how persuasively you present the gospel, that they're just going to reject Christ. And, and remember, they're rejecting Christ. They're not rejecting you. In 1945, before we dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, one of the things that America did, from what I understand, is we flew planes over in the days and weeks leading up to it, and we dropped little leaflets down to the people in those cities. And on those leaflets, there were warnings telling them that the atomic bomb was coming. They had picture diagrams even. They explained it. They said, if, they said you need to get out of the cities so that, that there wouldn't be loss of life, just loss of infrastructure. But if you know the story at all, you know that there were 135,000 people that were either killed or injured by that atomic bomb. Why is that? Because they rejected, they resisted the warning. There's going to be people like that. There's going to be time when you share the gospel and they're not going to accept it with willing hearts. And that's what happened with Stephen. In verses 9 and 11, let's just read it. It says, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, Cyrenius and Alexandrians, and of them Sicilia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit that they spake. So look what they did. Then they suburned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they can't out-debate Stephen. They can't find anything wrong with Stephen to have him accused of. And so what they do is they get guys to come and lie about Stephen. And uh, they, they resisted Stephen. They opposed Stephen. And yet Stephen remained faithful. You know, let me encourage you with this. Our job is not to make people accept Christ. Our job is to be faithful to deliver the message of Christ to them. It's God's job to do the work in someone's heart. It's, it's their job to accept that gift of salvation. You can't do it for them. Stephen, he was faithful to share the gospel even when no one received it. And you know, I, I'll tell you this. I, I've heard it said, I think there's a good heart behind it. I, I've heard people say, well, well, if we do vacation Bible school this week and even one kid gets saved, they'll say it's all worth it. And that's, that's a thing to praise the Lord for, isn't it? But, but I would go a step further and say this. If no one gets saved this week, it's still worth it. Because our job is not to be the one that convicts hearts and, and saves souls. Our job is to be faithful, to do the commission God has called us to, and to give the message of the gospel. And we have a God who is worth serving, and we have a God who is worth being faithful to. And even if no one gets saved this week, as long as we have been faithful to the Lord and done things with excellence and to the best of our ability, I think we can rejoice in that. That the Lord was honored. And Stephen, he was faithful. He was marked by faithfulness. Let me give you these last couple. We'll go quickly here. He was marked by truth. In verses 2 through 53 of the next chapter, Stephen preaches a 51-verse message to these guys. It is probably the greatest commentary there is on the Old Testament. And step by step, he, he simply gives them scripture and shows them that Christ was the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. 
And I tell you, that's what people need. They don't need our opinions. They don't need our programs. They need the truth of the Word of God. Stephen was marked by truth. He was marked by boldness. In verses 51 and 53, let's just read those, if you would, over in chapter 7. Look at, listen to what Stephen says to these guys who have the power and in a few minutes would take his life. Listen to the boldness. He said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which shewed uh, before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels, and have not kept it. Now that a preach, won't it? I tell you, if we uh, uh, preach like that today, you don't see many preachers like that around, do you? He was a bold man when it came to the witness. He never compromised his message. He didn't let the pressure of, uh, of social pressure change what he was going to say. He was a man of boldness. He didn't compromise even though it was going to cost him. He had boldness. I, uh, I read about a guy, you, I'm sure you've heard of him, his name is John Huss. John Huss in the 1400s was a preacher and uh, the Catholic Church took him and, and put him on trial because he preached that Christ was the only way to be saved. And they brought him before trial, and they said, uh, they said, John, you have two options. They said, you can either recant, and you can stop teaching what you're teaching about Christ being the only way, or you can be burned at the stake. And he has the, one of the greatest responses in history. His last name, Huss, it means goose. And his response that he said to them is this. He said, this goose is not afraid to be cooked. <laughs> That's a great response. You know, there will be times when being a witness for Christ takes some boldness. And it may not be to that level or the level that Stephen was, but, but it, it can be intimidating to invite someone to church. It can be intimidating to go up to a door and knock and, and invite those kids to vacation Bible school or to witness to that person at church. And, and Stephen, he was a man that was marked by boldness. Number nine, he was a man that was marked by honor. Look at verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast to the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Stephen, he had preached his message. The religious leaders and their anger and their hostility <coughs> began to stone him and, and cast these rocks on him to take his life. And in that moment, God allows Stephen to see into heaven. And what we see is not what we expect to see. What we see is Jesus Christ, not seated on his throne like he is in the rest of the New Testament, but we see him standing as he looked at what was happening to Stephen. He, he noticed Stephen's sacrifice, he honored Stephen's sacrifice, and he was with Stephen during his sacrifice. Stephen's faithfulness did not go unnoticed by the Lord. He was honored by Christ. You know, it's not always easy to represent Christ, but we serve a God who is faithful in the midst of those trials. And let me give you one last one. He was marked by impact. He was marked by impact. Stephen lived a full life. You, you may say, well, that doesn't sound like a full life. That sounds like a short life. It was a short life. But Stephen is proof that the effect of a man's life has nothing to do with the length of it. That there have been people that have lived a long time in this world and they have not ever made an impact with their life. Stephen, he was a man that made an impact. Stephen, it's interesting, he never got to see the result of his impact. Two things happened because of, of Stephen's sacrifice. First of all, that he became a martyr that launched the movement of the gospel being spread throughout the world. When he was persecuted and, 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 uh, and he was martyred, the church of Jerusalem, those 20, 30, 40,000 believers were scattered, we see in chapter 8, verse 1. And as a English-speaking church on the other side of the world, we should be thankful for Stephen's sacrifice. Because what Stephen did is he launched the movement that took the gospel to the ends of the world. And Stephen never saw that. He, he never got to see what his sacrifice entailed, but, but Stephen's impact outlived his own life. Not only that, 
but, but it seems to me that Stephen's testimony as he died had a great impact on a man that was named Saul. Later to be known as Paul, later to become one of the greatest missionaries the world's ever known. But Stephen never saw that. He never saw the movement that was launched by his sacrifice. He never saw the, the convert that he had a part in, in converting who became a great missionary. He didn't see any of those things, but he was a man whose impact outlived his life. I, I was thinking about this, and, and I was thinking about our missions conference. Do you remember Brother Tika's story? Uh, re remind me if I get it wrong, but I, I believe what he said was his grandfather in the Philippines had been given a Bible by a man in the Philippines, did not know the man, did not know who he was afterwards, and his grandfather got saved. And I believe, what was it, 600 churches had been planted through his grandfather and his family since then. And, and, and I, I thought about that, and I thought, you know, that man has no idea the impact that his life made and the impact that is outliving his life. And that's what we're praying for this week. <coughs> Our prayer is that this week, the impact of this week will outlive this week. We're, we're praying that in a hundred years from now, in a thousand years from now, some of the things that are done this week will still be making an impact. And there will be someone whose soul is in heaven because of what has taken place this week. And Stephen, he was a man marked by impact. He, he made a difference in other people's lives. His impact outlived his own life. So as we head into our Vacation Bible School week, and, and really as we live our daily lives, we're called to be witnesses. And Stephen, he gives us some great marks of how to be an effective witness for Christ. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes with me? And simply, I just want to ask tonight, if there is someone on your heart that the Lord has laid on your heart, whether it's the young people coming this week, whether it is someone that you're related to or work with, but there is someone the Lord has laid on your heart to be a witness to, would you just raise your hand so we can together pray for those that the Lord has put in our path? Praise the Lord. There is someone that needs the Lord. I, I know them. I can interact with them. So pray for them. <coughs> well, let's pray that God would use us to be the impact that that person needs to come to know Christ. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the chance to come and to study your word and, and this man named Stephen who, who outlived his life by the decisions he made while he was here on earth. And, and Lord, I pray that you would do the same for our church. I pray that this week as we, we minister to these kids that, that you would make an impact in these young people. They would come to know you and we praise you for it. We pray that you would be with those that are represented by raised hands that, that need to come know you. That you would orchestrate opportunities. That you would orchestrate softness of heart. And that we would see people saved because of the, the heart and need behind this church. We thank you for all you've done. We just pray. Would you stay with me, please? Turn to hymn number 400.